Well, hi and welcome. My name is Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Jeringong Anglican Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our online prayer book service today. Uh, thanks for joining us. A little bit later, we'll be sharing in the Lord's Supper together, so you might like to uh, get some bread and some wine ready to go uh, so that you can join in with that, with that part of the service. But we're actually going to start off our service by singing a wonderful hymn of praise to our God. The service order we'll be following today, you'll be able to find on page 134 of the Green Australian Prayer Books. Uh, so page 134, the second order of communion. The Lord be with you. To begin our service, it's here from the Word of God. When you call to me, says the Lord, I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you and honour you. Let us pray. Will you join with me at the prayer of preparation at the top of page 135? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Now, of course, we don't always do those things, do we? We don't always love God with our heart, soul, mind and strength or our neighbours ourselves. So in penitence and faith, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness of sins to all who turn to him in faith, pardons us and sets us free from all our sins. He strengthens us to do his will and keeps us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In response to that message of forgiveness, what a joyful message that is, uh, will you join with me in the hymn of praise at the bottom of page 137. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, before we hear from God's word, let me pray the collect for today. God of power and life, glory of all who believe in you, Fill the world with your splendour and show the nations the light of your truth. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to be reading the whole chapter. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another... Dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves do wrong, and you, you cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. 
but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Our Gospel today comes from the Gospel according to John in chapter 8, and we're reading verses 1 to 11. John chapter 8. Then each went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Here ends the lesson. Thanks be to God. Well, before we think further on those passages, will you join with me as we say together the Nicene Creed? Reminds us of the things that bind us together as God's people. It's on page 139 of of the prayer books. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, when it comes time for elections in our country, one of the issues that's often raised is that of immigration. You're certainly hearing a lot about it in the lead up to the US election. It seems that there are many people in Australia, as in the US, uh, who are scared of the impact the immigrants will have. Why are they scared? Well, I guess they're scared because they might take our jobs or that they might be terrorists or they might uh, want to come in and change the way we live. Um, now, of course, most of these reasons are completely ill-founded. Uh, generally speaking, we're talking about people who are simply wanting to they're simply trying to survive. Many have fled uh, in fear of their lives from their own countries. Uh, they've got no aspiration to take over our country and cause us any harm. I want you to imagine, though, a refugee who comes to live in Australia. This is a totally fictitious uh, example. Uh, this man comes to live here, and he lives here for a number of years and settles down. Um, he gets to know all about Australia, its customs and its language. Um, after a while, he, uh, he goes through the process of becoming an Australian citizen. 
which is okay for a while, but pretty soon it becomes clear that he isn't really interested in being part of our nation. He's happy to have a Medicare card and to get the unemployment benefits, but he doesn't let anyone know about the job he has, and so he doesn't pay any tax. Uh, he constantly complains about everything, about from the weather to food and the people. Um, he, then he starts to ignore the road rules. He came from a country where they drive on the right-hand side of the road, so that's what he does. He drives straight through red lights and interprets give way signs as meaning everyone should give way to me. Uh, whenever he sees an Australian flag, he throws red paint over it. On Anzac Day, he deliberately drives past dawn services with his stereo blasting during the minute, minute silence. What do you think of this kind of person? What do you think of his citizenship? I mean, it seems a bit ridiculous, doesn't it? I mean, to move into a country, uh, why become a citizen if you've no intention of fitting in or obeying any of the rules of that country? Now, the reason I ask this is not because I think that any of the refugees coming to Australia will do this, but because, pe because many people coming to God do this. We've been looking at Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and it's pretty clear that they've got a few problems. We've heard about all the divisions in the church, and last week we heard about some, um, some gross sexual misconduct by a couple of people in the church, and, which had been ignored by, and appro even approved of by the rest. Um, at the end of chapter 6, as you'll see, Paul returns to this whole topic of sexuality, uh, but in the, in the middle is this bit about going to court. How do all these things fit together? They seem so disconnected. Well, I think that both of these issues flow out of the same core problem, the fact that the Corinthians who were supposed to be living in God's kingdom, uh, but they were living as though they were, they were still living in their old country, in the world. You see, today's verse, first problem you see in chapter 6, verse 1. If any one of, one of you has a dispute with one another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? It seems that there were some, these divisions that were in the church in Corinth were actually beginning to overflow into the secular legal system. In other words, the Corinthians were taking each other to court. Now, I don't think he's suggesting that being involved in actions in secular courts over criminal acts is wrong. In fact, um, consistently in the, old, in the New Testament, there's an understanding that the responsibility of secular courts and governments is their, their responsibility to main, maintain justice. God has given them a, a particular role and responsibility in our world. Um, and we, we shouldn't shy away from that. However, what he's talking about here is two Christians taking their disputes about church or about private matters into the secular courts. Why would they do this? Seems a weird thing to do. Well, according to one of the commentators I, I read on this topic, uh, it says the Greeks were naturally and characteristically a litigious people. The Greeks were in fact famous or notorious uh, for their love of going to law. Uh, it seems that some of them have brought this way of behaving that they've grown up with and this way of operating into the church. You see, for Paul, this litigiousness was really merely another example of the world seeping into the church. In other words, by taking each other to court, they were simply acting like the people around them. They'd taken on the world's standards of behaviour. It seems as if the Corinthian Christians uh, saw some way of getting ahead or that they thought their rights were being infringed, they would think nothing of taking uh, even their Christian brothers and sisters to court to get what they want. They were acting just like the people around them. They didn't care how it impacted them. Um, if someone stood in their way what they wanted, they, they took them to court to get it. Which is actually an incredibly familiar-sounding culture, isn't it? Uh, you see that particularly uh, in the US, but also increasingly here in Australia, um, so similar, actually, that it's frightening. Um, and we even see this, this thing happening in the church. Uh, a few years ago, um, in the US, uh, there were churches uh, who decided to leave, uh, leave, disconnect from their diocese because they recognised that their diocese had gone against God's words in some key areas of morality. Well, the diocese took them to court um, to make sure that they didn't get to keep their property, that they had to get booted out of their property. That's the kind of thing that I think he's talking about here. So what should they be doing instead, in Paul's mind? Well, firstly, they should be being willing to be wronged. You see, the way of Jesus, the way of God's kingdom, is the way of forgiveness, the way of grace, the way of turning the other cheek, looking out for the needs of others rather than launching missiles or countersuits at them. 
The fact that they're going to court at all, says Paul, is a sign that they've been completely defeated already, he says in verse 7. So firstly, they say, well, why, why would you go to court to get what you want? Because it's, it's, not, it's not all about you. But secondly, Paul says that we should be able to, as a church, be able to decide these matters ourselves. God has given the church enough wisdom to be able to work through these kind of issues together, if, if, if they ever do turn up. Quite apart from that, he says, the secular world doesn't see the world the same way that we do. How can a secular court make decisions about theological matters? It's not even in their way of thinking. So why would we go to them to decide? You see, the Corinthians were still living like they were living in the world, in the kingdom of the world. But of course, this litigiousness was not the only way this showed itself. And so in verse 12, Paul returns to his discussion on the abuse of sex in the church. And it seems the situation in chapter 5 is no isolated incident. Well, what's going on here? It seems that some members of the Corinthian church had understood, rightly, that when you become a Christian, you're set free from the slavery of the law. No longer do we have to slavishly obey all the minutiae of the, of the law in order to be saved. We're saved by God's grace. We are free. The problem is that they had taken that idea of freedom and distorted it beyond recognition. It had become a catch, catch cry for them. Everything is permissible in their minds. In other words, I can do whatever I like, or rather, nobody has the right to tell me what to do or what not to do. What does it matter uh, if I have an affair or go to visit a sex worker? That's got nothing to do with my faith. You see, they'd bought into, uh, into the way of thinking of the influential Greek philosopher Plato, who forged a division between the physical and the spiritual realms. In his view, uh, what really mattered was the spiritual plane. That's the thing that lasts. The physical world, including our bodies, are just vessels that have no real value. So it doesn't really matter what you do with your body. They have no impact on the spiritual side of our life. Those two things are separate. I guess that's why the Corinthians had the slogan, we read in verse 13, the food for the stomach and the stomach for food. They had the attitude that, that sex is simply a bodily function, like eating or going to the toilet. The body has sexual organs, so you might as well use them. And that's what they were doing. It sounds like they thought nothing of going to visit um, the, perhaps even the, the temple uh, prostitutes. Which, again, sounds very familiar to our world. It's very similar to the way people speak today. For many in our world, um, sex is just seen as a bodily function. Um, so that we had the right to use however we feel. As long as we don't hurt anyone else, uh, we should be free to do as we please. Well, in response to this catch cry about freedom, Paul says, yes, we do have freedom, but, but not at all costs. We've been freed from slavery to the law, but that does not mean that we should just allow ourselves to be enslaved by something else. Our guiding principle has not become, I can do whatever I want, because, as Paul says in verse 12, not everything is beneficial. And also, that we should not be mastered by anything. For we only have one master, and that is Jesus. You see, Paul reminds the, the Corinthians that the body is not just meant for, it's not meant for sexual immorality, it's meant for the Lord. When you become a Christian, it's not as if um, you are then let loose to do whatever you want. Christians are not Platonists. The Bible doesn't promote the idea that God is only interested in what we uh, in our spirits and not in our bodies. Uh, no, Paul says in verse 15 that our bodies are now members with Christ. In other words, when you become united to Christ, um, it includes our bodies. What's more, he says in verse 19, that the Holy Spirit comes to live in our bodies. Because of this, says Paul, we are created to honour Christ with all of our being, in, being including our bodies. Um, it, it's the same thing Paul says in Romans chapter 12, where he says, um, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. We are to do this in all, every part of our lives, in the way we relate, in the way we deal with conflict, in the way we eat, in the way we exercise, and the way we have sex. He lives in us, so how can we then continue to live in sin? I mean, is it honouring Christ? Uh, who lives in us for us to be sleeping around, or to read pornographic magazine, magazines, or visit all those websites? Is it honouring to him to push the boundaries in office flirting, whatever it might be? As if that's not reason enough uh, for us to use God, sex as God intended, Paul says there's also something different about sexual sin in verse 18. 
verse 18, he says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. And whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He said there's something different about, uh, about sex. God gave us sex as a physical consummation of two people becoming one flesh, physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. Sex is part of the glue that was designed to bind two people for life. It is physical, but it's also spiritual. Anyone who tries to separate the two is, a, is fooling themselves. There's no such thing as merely recreational sex. Which is, one of, course, is of course, one of the problems of pornography. It promotes the idea that you can separate the sexual act from any kind of relationship. That's why those who, who use it find that it's incredibly addictive because it never truly satisfies. It never is being used for, uh, for what it was meant, intended for. Paul is saying that there are, there are other, the other types of sin are, are an expression of rebellion and rejection against God. Sexual sin is that, but it's also damaging to who you are as a person. It's a sin against your own body. That's why he says we should flee from sexual immorality. Just as an aside, I think it's, there's an interesting paradox in our world's view about sex. On one hand, uh, people, those who, who think of it as just a bodily function, you know, the stomach for the food, etc., the stomach for food, etc. Um, it has no lasting value. It's just about having fun. So you can have fun with whoever you want, however you want, as, as long as you don't hurt anyone. But one of the sad consequences of that attitude, is, as we've seen, is uh, is you see in the whole kind of hookup culture that happens in our world. Um, I was listening to someone speak about this topic this week, and they they rightly said that for many, sex is now a commodity that um, the relationships people have when they hook up are, are just contests to see who cares less. And anyone who does start to care uh, is labelled as clingy. You, know, you drop into Macca's for a, for a bite to eat when you're hungry, so what's wrong with just hooking up with someone when you feel the need for sex? It's a tragic devaluing of something uh, incredibly beautiful that God has created. So on that, we have that extreme. However, however ironically, our culture also goes to the other extreme, Sex is often um, described as being central to who we are. People define themselves by the way they want to have sex. So much so that if you disagree with what someone wants to do, you're express expressing hatred to them as the, to their very person, the very core of who they are. Paul would say, I think, that both of these extremes go too far. Sex is more than a bodily function. It was given by God to unite you two people in the, the most intimate way possible. But it does not define who we are. What defines us is our relationship with Jesus. In the end, there are two kinds of people. People of the kingdom and people of this world. The Corinthian church's problems all seem to sprout uh, from their seem seeming desire to live in both of these worlds. They were like, like our new citizen at the beginning. They, they'd uh, become part of God's kingdom. They were happy to enjoy its benefits but they didn't want to actually live as they were there, as if they were there at all. They wanted to live like they were still in this world. The central chapters of this verse, verse of this chapter, sorry, uh, verses nine to eleven, uh, give us two important reminders. Paul says in verse nine, "Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither sexually immoral, or idolaters, or, nor adulterers, nor men who have se had se have sex with men, nor thieves." Nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. We cannot go on living like the world and expect to be part of God's kingdom. Notice that he doesn't say someone who falls into one of these errors cannot come into the kingdom, but rather someone who lives this way is a matter of course. Whoever defines themselves by this way of living, the sexually immoral, uh, the homosexual, the thieves, the greedy, uh, etc. If we want to continue to live the way of the world, we're excluding ourselves from God's kingdom. Paul wants us to know that our physical and spiritual sides are completely interwoven. Our bodies belong to the Lord as much as our souls. Indeed, Christ dwells in us. So it matters how we live. If he lives in us, we should not go on living as we did before, the way the world lives. And of course, we can let the world into our lives in so many ways, can't we? Um, through our divisions, through gossip, through backbiting, through bitterness and cynicism, as well as through sexual sin or by taking others to court. I wonder what your pitfall is. 
are the ways in which the world is seeping into your life uh, that you need to remove from your life right now. We cannot expect to go on living as the world does uh, if we want to be part of God's kingdom. It mu- we must be changed. Well, finally, Paul also reminds us uh, that, those, that those things um, defined where we came from, not where we are now. And so in verse 11, he says, And that is what some of you were, but you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. We've been changed, we've been transformed. Um, we're no longer just defined by our state of rebellion against God. If we, instead, we're defined by our relationship with Jesus, who has washed us and made us his own. That's who we are now, and we should live up to who we are. In the end, it seems that many of the Corinthians' problems came as a result of letting too much of the world into their lives and into their church. We need to be careful not to make the same mistakes. We cannot go on living like the world if we to remain parts of God's kingdom. So where is your citizenship? Where do you belong? Are you living as a citizen of God's kingdom? Or are you still living like someone who lives, who's, belongs to the world? Paul was to challenge us uh, in all of our thinking, uh, not just our sexuality, but in our, as we think about our money and our time and our relationships, how we deal with conflict and all of those things, uh, that we need to live as God's people, as kingdom people, uh, rather than those who live in the world. So let us live as citizens of heaven. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for drawing us into your kingdom. Thank you for giving us new life through Jesus. Please help us to live as people, uh, as your people in this world. Help us not to follow the ways of this world, but to follow the ways of your Son. And it's for his name and for his glory that we pray. Amen. Well, in response to what we've heard from God's word, will you join with me as we pray together? You can follow along on page 140 of the prayer books. Let us pray for all people and for the church throughout the world. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has promised that you'll hear us when we ask in faith. Receive the prayers we offer. We pray for the church around the world. We pray for the unity of your people gathered around your word. Lord, may, we, may all your people submit to the, the truth of your word, proclaim it fearlessly and boldly. And Father, we pray that you would work through your church across the world uh, to bring more people into your kingdom. We pray particularly for our our church's link missionaries. We pray for the cows in Italy. We pray for Andrew and Beck uh, in the Middle East. We also pray for the Damons in Cobar and uh, the Shoalhaven Aboriginal Community Church. We ask, Father, that you might work through all of these and other ministries uh, for the good of your people and for the proclamation of your gospel. May all people come to know to hear about you and come to put their trust in you. Strengthen your people for their witness and work in the world and empower your ministers faithfully to proclaim the gospel and to administer your holy sacraments. Unite in the truth all who confess your name, that we may live together in love and proclaim your glory in all the world. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, we also pray for the peoples of the world. We give you thanks for our leaders, for our Prime Minister and and Premier. We give you thanks for Charles, our King. And we pray for each of them and all those who who minister underneath them, to all those who work in government and public service, that they might work for the good of our nation and for the, the, the good of the people in it. But we also pray for other leaders around the world as they address the big issues that are facing our world at the moment. We continue to pray for peace in the Ukraine. We also pray for peace in places like Eritrea and Myanmar and Yemen and Nigeria and South Sudan and and in Syria. Lord God, we ask that you might bring peace where there seems to be no possibility of peace. We ask that you might bring to repentance those who... Uh, have acted selfishly or greedily, those who act with pride. And Lord, we pray that the leaders of the world might might unite uh, in their attacks on the big issues like uh, climate change 
and uh, refugees across the world and world poverty. Father, we ask that you might help all leaders to, to find common ground rather than seeking their own good, seek, just but seeking the good of others. Give wisdom to those in authority in every land and guide all peoples in the way of righteousness and peace so that they may share with justice the resources of the earth, work together in trust and seek the common good. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We also pray for our own community. We give you thanks for the beautiful place that it is uh, to live in Gerringong and surrounds. We thank you for the peace and the freedom that we enjoy here. But we recognise that there are still many people in our community who don't know you. There are so many people living their lives without reference to you, Lord. And so we ask that you might move in their hearts. Use us in whatever way you see fit to bring glory to your name and the proclamation of your truth to, to our our needing word world. We commend to your keeping, Father, ourselves and each other, our families, our neighbours and our friends. Enable us by your spirit to live in love for you and for one another. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We also pray for those who are in need. There are so many in our world who are suffering from sickness depression, anxiety, poverty, abuse, uh, and so many other sufferings. We pray for those who are grieving, for those who uh, have been left out, for those who are f feeling sad or, or sick in any way. We pray also for those who care for them. You might like to bring before God, to God now those known to you who are suffering. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness or any other trouble. Give them a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who minister to them and bring us all into the joy of your salvation. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we praise you, Lord God, for your faithful servants in every age. And we pray that we, with all who have died in the faith of Christ, may be brought to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of your eternal kingdom. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to come now to share in the Lord's Supper together. So if you haven't done so already, you might like to organise to get some bread and some wine or juice um, so that you can take part in this part of the service. We're picking up the service on page 143. In John 3.16 we read, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the Apostle Paul writes, As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man or woman examine themselves and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So will you join with me in the prayer of humble access you'll find at the bottom of page 143. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that, we, that he may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. If you return with me in your prayer books to page 165, page 165, we'll continue with the, form, the fourth form of the thanksgiving. And as you do, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. 
it is right to give him thanks and praise. All glory and honour, thanks and praise be yours now and always. Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator, ever living God. We give thanks and praise for your son, our saviour, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now, Father, we pray that we who receive these, your gifts of bread and wine, according to our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and his blood. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And we give him thanks to you, his almighty Father. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And again, giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We offer our prayer and praise, Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours for ever and ever. Amen. We who are many are one body in Christ, for we all share in the one bread. Come, let us take this holy sacrament, the body and blood of Christ, in remembrance that he died for us, and feed on him in our hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. So taking the bread. Take and eat this, in remembrance that Christ died, that your sins can be forgiven, and be thankful. And taking the cup, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. In John 1 we read, To all who received him, to all who believed in his name, Christ gave the power to become children of God. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us in this hope that we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. And on page 174 we pray together. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, we've almost come to the end of our service, but before we do, let's sing together.
Well, can I say thank you for joining us for our online service today. I hope you've been encouraged and even challenged from the things that you've heard uh, as we've looked at God's word together, as we've prayed and sung and shared in the Lord's, Lord's Supper together. To finish off our service, now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.